continue with the cardiology problem so there will be this will be part two of the video we finished with question number 69 and that video should be available uh, for you to watch we're going to continue with question number 84 i i see ian he has his hands raised if you like to go with number 84 you're more than welcome to proceed all right in cardiac muscle, the fast depolarization phase of the action potential is the result of increased membrane permeability to sodium ions. Yeah, that is that is correct, right? Increase of permeability to the sodium ions, uh, and that's the depolarization phase. Yeah, I think I went over that in quite detail. By the way, uh, do you recall from the medications that we talked about, antiarrhythmic medications, what is the medication that, that blocks sodium channels on the antiarrhythmics. Do you recall? The amio. Which one? Lidocaine. Lidocaine, yeah. Lidocaine is correct. Amiodarone has a mixed action, so I wouldn't classify it as, as a pure sodium channel blocker. But out of the um, antiarrhythmics that you have, right, lidocaine, Lidocaine is your sodium channel, and with your new REMAC uh, protocol changes, you now have the option for ventricular dysrhythmias to give either amiodarone or lidocaine. So definitely um, know the classification of these medications. Okay, uh, number 85, we're going to go with Irene. Okay, the long plateau phase of the cardiac muscle action potential is due to... So let me, if from the diagram that I was drawing, so this was the action potential, and what they're referring to is this phase here. Mm hmm Okay. Uh, long, okay. Moving a few actions. Bear with me a second. No problem. Getting open. Increase my ions, decrease the amount of calcium in the part of the membrane, increase my memory. I would hate to guess. You could guess. I'm going to go with B, voltage gated calcium channels remaining open. Yeah, your, your guess is correct. That's the correct answer, right? So Thank you. Uh, the the phase that I drew here, right? So first, yeah. initially, right, you have the some sodium trickling in, and then voltage-gated mm -hmm. sodium channels open up, so you have this rapid uh, mm -hmm. spike, and that's what causes depolarization. At this point, right, you have both um, sodium um, channels that are open, but at this point, right, we also have the potassium channels that become becoming mm -hmm. active, and we have potassium efflux. So mm -hmm. K plus is leaving the cell, and right. at this, and as it's like lowering, you see how it starts to lower. At the same time, mm -hmm. we get uh, calcium channels that open up, and mm -hmm. calcium usually is more abundant outside, so calcium mm -hmm. starts to flow in. And for this phase, mm -hmm. you basically have uh, potassium that's leaving, and calcium that's coming in. So they kind of cancel each other out. So that's why you see this like plateau phase here. Yeah. Yeah. Because... I was just prepared to ask that because I noticed I was saying when I was going over it. I was saying that it's two things happening at one time. That's the reason why it has that that yeah. long plateau before it hits the drop. That is correct, right? So the 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 it's potassium efflux and uh, calcium influx. So this is influx, meaning as in it's coming in, and then potassium efflux, as in it's leaving, right? So that's what causes that uh, that phase, right? Uh, by the way, uh, anyone can tell me a calcium channel blocker medication from your protocols? Yeah. Or from the lecture we talked about? Diltiazem. Uh, wh which one is that, Milan? Diltiazem. Diltiazem is correct, right? Diltiazem. Is a, is a calcium channel. And uh, I know it's a mixed action, but what technically is classified as potassium channel blocker? Uh, per the one Williams classification. Amio? Amio is correct, yes. Okay. 
Okay, Nico, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, in this process of the channel remaining open, this is ATPA driven, correct? Because it's going against the natural grade. So uh, this is this is voltage ga gated. This is not ATP gated. This is voltage gated. So it's uh, uh, at this at this point, right? As the sodium came in, we mm. had threshold at negative seventy mm. let's say millivolts. Mm. Sodium channels voltage gated. Sodium channels open, and then we have a lot of sodium coming in. It went okay. to this phase. At this phase, right, we have potassium voltage gated channels that open. So we have potassium leaving. And as it starts to lower the in millivolts, becoming a little bit more negative, as it's going towards its equilibrium, calcium okay. voltage gated channels open, and calcium is more abundant in the in the extracellular space. So we have uh, calcium flowing inside. So okay. all these channels that I'm referring to, all of these are voltage gated. There is a, such a thing as uh, ATP gated. Right, we're mm -hmm. going to learn about that actually in our next lecture for okay. Um, okay. Um, endocrine, right? About insulin uh, um, secretion, right? Okay. So insulin secretion is actually uh, functions with potassium, mm -hmm. potassium uh, ATP gated channels. Okay, but Thank you. in this case, they're all voltage gated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions for this? All right, so we're going to go to 86. Uh, we have Milan for 86. In cardiac muscle, calcium ions uh, play an important role in repolarizing the membrane after the polarization phase. E, maybe. Uh, so uh, uh, the calcium channels. So what was what we just talked about? To give you a hint. The calcium ions. Um, what, what, uh, type of channels we talk, what type of channels um, we talked about just now? Voltage gated. Yeah. So uh, D enter D. to the cell. Slow yeah. voltage gated ion channels. These these are the correct answer. They enter through the slow voltage gated ion channels. But uh, uh, what? Cation plays an important role in repolarization of the membrane. What repolarizes? Potassium. So, pota correct. Because sodium, right? I just, this picture, go back to this picture, right? Sodium came in. So sodium was acting as depolarization. And then when we have the potassium ef uh, efflux that's leaving, right? Slowly as this is going forward, right? As time passes by, calcium channels will close, but uh, sorry, uh, calcium channels will close, but potassium channels still remain open. So we have potassium that keeps leaving the cell and then wants to drive it towards negative uh, potassium equilibrium, which is I think maybe 88 milliequivalents, millivolts, I should say. Right. So as it's leaving the cell and it's decreasing the voltage potential, see how it's decreasing. So as, as it's decreasing, it wants to drive towards this negative minus 88. But before reaching there, right, they close. So the repolarization sensitive would be uh, potassium. So that's repolarization. And if I were to draw, um, let me take a different color. If I were to draw an EKG to superimpose on this graph, right, the way the EKG signal will look like this, this would be your P wave. This would be a QRS. This would be the upstroke of your R wave. And here would be the T wave. Right? So P, Q, R, S, T. So here, when the potassium is leaving the cell at this point, this will correspond to the T wave of your EKG cycle. And we know that's the phase where repolarization of your ventricles occur. All right. So 86 is the uh, 89. We'll go to uh, Lita. The normal pacemaker of the heart is located in uh, the SA node. SA node, right? And what's the uh, 
um, I should say, beats per minute that we expect it to fire at, roughly uh, speaking? 60 to 100. Yeah, that is correct. Right, 60 to 100 beats per minute. Very good. Okay. Uh, number 90. Uh, we're going to go with... Question about uh, that. Is the Perginsky fibers the ones that's for ventricles? That is correct. Yeah. Okay. So the Perginsky fibers are, um, they, if we have, let's say, this is your atria, right? This is your SA node, goes to the AV node. This is your bundle branches, right? And then these branches here at the very tips that go to your ventricles, those are the Perginsky. And essentially, uh, do you know why we, like, what's the purpose of this conductive system? Like, why do we need it? Because if you think about it, cardiac myocytes, they have the property uh, to self-depolarize. They could conduct signals from one another through gap, gap junctions, right? We talked about uh, specific gap junctions that can propagate impulses. They also can propagate uh, ions. So ions can flow. So what's the purpose? Why do we need this conductive system? So that if uh, one fails, the fail other one fails. Uh, James, you were saying? If one fails, the other one can pick up and continue on. It's basically like a fail state, like uh, Lita said. It's a it, fail state. It, so if it, the SA no start working, then AV no kicks in. It's, AV it's, no kicks in. It, it's true, it's fail safe, but there, the inherently, let's say there's no problems. So like, let's say there is no a pathology, right? So <clears throat> the main reason, the main reason we have these uh, uh, Perkinsky fibers, AV, uh, right, SA, is that you have fast uh, conduction of impulse propagation. So it's, it goes uh, impulse propagation, and then you have the mechanical contraction of the actual, um, the heart. And if we did not have the system, right? Let's say this was, this is your heart, right? This is your ventricles. If we did not have the system, the way these cells would depolarize, they would actually have to go from cell to cell via these gap junctions. And this, this process will take much, much longer and that's when you see patients who have, let's say, a right bundle branch block, or they have left bundle branch block. They one of these uh, bundle branches is cut off due to whatever pathology they sustained. So let's say a patient comes comes in with left bundle branch block, their QRS will not look like this, which is uh, you know tight, which we usually say less than you know zero point twelve seconds. You will see more like you'll see exaggerated morphologies like this, and the QRS will be much, much prolonged. Like it could be 0 0.20 seconds or so forth. And the reason that is occurring is because their left bundle branch block, uh, sorry, their left bundle branch is blocked due to the pathology they sustain, right? And so it has to now go from cell to cell via these gap junctions in order to depolarize, which takes longer time and, you know, uh, this is not beneficial for some, you know, for your heart. We want that fast contraction, right? So that the impulse propagates and then we have the mechanical contraction of the heart. So that's the uh, purpose of these, you know, conductive, conductive system. But if they fail, right? Yeah, uh, what you said is correct. The next one over, the next one will take over, right? And even if the next one over is dead, right? Then we still have cell to cell propagation, right? So that's... The purpose of this all right okay so um number 90 we're gonna go with uh, uh, uh Lindsay. uh i just had a quick question before that so when you're talking about a conduction cell or conduction being blocked it's not like a thrombosis right it's like cell damage uh so it could be it could be both so for example uh think about it if you have a thrombus that's occluding blood flow to either your SA node or it's occluding blood flow to one of your bundle branches. So if it occludes and it's long enough and it's not reperfused, uh, that circulation, that blood flow to that area is cut off. So you may have death of that conductive tissue. And if you have death of that conductive tissue, it's not gonna function. That's why before, right, uh, they would say a new onset of left bundle branch block, they considered a stem, like considered the STEMI, ST segment elevation, why? Because in a setting of new left bundle branch block, they thought maybe it was a thrombus that occluded the blood flow to it. So if you have a EK, let's say you have two EKGs, one from a patient before he didn't have a left bundle and all of a sudden he has a new left bundle branch block, uh, they said that it's possible it's secondary to NMI, so they would want to take him to the cath lab. So you could have, an, you could have uh, 
the system fail secondary to an occlusive right thrombus so that could certainly occur that's why uh you know we we always compare all the kgs to the new one uh in the hospital setting in the pre-hospital it's tough to do that because you don't have a prior ekg to look at okay that makes sense that's yeah, secondary all right uh, the following are structural components of the conducting system of the heart one percentage fibers two av bundle two av node of three AV node, four sa five bundle inches. The sequence in which execution will move through the system is which of the following? So with, with questions like this, the best advice I can give you is always find what should be number one, and then by that, eliminate the choices that you know are, uh, are incorrect to begin with. All right, so we know SA not first, so they can yeah. only be D or E. So we eliminate A, right? We eliminate yep. B, we eliminate T. So now we, we, are, we are between D and E. So after SA node, it goes to? The AV node, so that would be three. Because the, the AV bundle, that's the bundle of, of his yeah, adapter. Correct. correct. So it goes to the AV bundle, right? So for this here, we can already see, right? We can already eliminate E. Yep. So D is the correct choice. So it goes from the SA node to the AV node, to the AV bundle, right? Then it goes to the bundle branches, and then the Purkinje fibers is the final uh, point. And then um, your ventricles depolarize, and uh, you basically have the mechanical contraction. So that's the correct choice here. Good. All right, number 94. Any questions about this? No questions? All right, number 94. Let's see who we have. Uh, we have James for number 94. All right. If the pacemaker cells in the SA node become more permeable to potassium ions, it's going to be. I'm going to go with A. The heart rate will increase. Right. So the that that uh, remember what the potassium does, right? So what's the role of the potassium? uh yeah so, so let's so let's go back to this one so potassium right was leaving the cell from here you take the highlighter yeah the potassium is leaving so the goal of the potassium leaving is then to get to this negative uh st status or it's resting uh or it's equilibrium potential so when the potassium is leaving, right, it's making the membrane uh, more negative or it's taking it to uh, repulsation st status, right? Both heart rate will de decrease and membranes will hypopolarize. That is correct. E. Yeah, E is the correct choice, right? So heart rate will decrease uh, and here it will hyperpolarize. So it's going to become more, uh, more electronegative, driving it to that negative 88 uh, threshold. So E is the correct choice here. On uh, 95, we're going to go with Brian. If the connection between the SA node and the AV node becomes blocked, um, I believe it's B, the ventricles will be more slowly. Uh, the ventricles will be more slowly. That's correct, right? So the connection between SA node and AV node becomes blocked. The ventricles will beat more slowly. That is correct. Uh, if you think about it, right, this is essentially when we have hard blocks. So uh, if you learn in your lecture, right, we have um, first degree hard block, which is not true, a true hard block. Then we have second degrees and we have different types. We have type one, two, right? We have third degree hard block. So the way you tell these hard blocks apart uh, is basically what the um, AV node is doing, right? Is the impulse conducting through it or it's not. So in the third degree hard block, we have complete AV dissociation, right? In the second degree type one and type two, we have partial. First degree hard block is not truly a hard block, it's just a prolongation of PR interval, which is usually greater than uh, 0 0.20 seconds. And uh, just while we are on this topic, for your hard block type two, right? Uh, second degree type one or type two, and your hard block type three, 
when you're interpreting the rhythm, all you have to say is basically there's a second degree type one, there's a second degree type two, or there's a second, or there's a third degree. But whenever you're dealing with the first degree hard block, besides stating that it's a hard block, right? First degree hard block, you must give an underlying rhythm. So what I mean by that, let's say your underlying rhythm is sinus bradycardia. So you will, your full interpretation to get full credit should be a sinus bradycardia with first degree hard block. Or it could be a sinus rhythm. So then you will say it's a sinus rhythm with, uh, uh, or sinus rhythm with first degree hard block. You could, all, you could have tachycardia, you could have, you could have sinus tachycardia with first degree hard block. So depending on the underlying rhythm, right, you must state the underlying rhythm first, followed by first degree hard block. For uh, second degrees and your third degrees, you don't have to do that. Okay. Uh, so good, 95, 96, we are going to go uh, with Curtis. Uh, pacemaker cells isolated from the SA node generate action potentials at uh, eighty to hundred beats per yeah. minute. So for this for this book, uh, yeah, eighty to one hundred is correct. If you wanna say sixty to one hundred, it's also correct. Uh, as long as you are in the ballpark, we see the other choices. They're they're outside of that range. So n none of the choices besides this one would actually make any sense. Uh, so yeah, 97, we're going to go with Jackson. The P wave of the electrocardiogram is a signal from A, the depolarized SA node. Right. So the, it's, is it the depolarization of the SA node that, that shows you as a P wave? on the ECG. So what does the P wave actually show you? Depolarization of what? So that, yeah, go ahead, Jackson. I know it's depolarized, but... Um... It, it is depolarization, but what specifically gets depolarized on the electrocardiogram? What's the part of the heart? So that the part of the heart that gets depolarized is the atria, right? Okay. It's not it's not the SA node. So the P wave is actually showing you depolarization of the atria. And then uh, uh, where anyone can answer, you could answer Jackson if you like. Where do we see repolarization uh, of the atria on the ECG? Uh. Where, where do we can see I this? go? Yeah, any of you can go within the the ventricles, the QRS. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's essentially it's hidden, right? So the repolarization of the atria is hidden in the QRS. Uh, why? Because the QRS depolarization is much stronger signal. Uh, it's much stronger vector, right? Which shows that on the EKG. So it's basically hidden. It's still there, but you are unable to see it because of the very strong vector produced by the ventricular depolarization. Uh, 98, we're going to go with, uh, I'm going to, if I mispronounce your name, just correct me. Is it Ak Akash Deep? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, depolarization of the ventricle is pre uh, represent on the electrocardiogram by QRS complex. Correct. The QRS complex is the correct. So that's what we just talked about. Yeah. All right. Uh, 99. Let's. I think we're gonna go back from the beginning. We're gonna go back to Ian. The T wave on an ECG tracing represents ventricular repolarization. Correct. Uh, ventricular repolarization. Yeah, that is the correct choice. Uh, number 102. We're gonna go with Irene. During the T wave electrocardiogram, the ventricles are electrically depolarized and functionally contracting uh and functionally are they contracting relaxing relaxing yeah sorry <laughs> yeah. because uh if you think about it right they gotta relax yeah, in order to goes down. Yeah, yeah they gotta they gotta and also right they gotta re start receiving the blood uh, right. for the next contractual phase so the okay. the correct answer here is d all right yeah. number 108 um we're gonna go with milan 
the heart is innervated by both parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves. Yeah, we have the we have the uh, essay note uh, that has uh, sympathetic stimulation to it. We also have the vagus nerve with a parasympathetic stimulation to it. Um, so yes, both both systems innervate the heart, and depending on uh, you know your status, right? Whatever you are required at moment, that's the system will, that will predominate. But both of them working. All right, so uh, we're going to go 110 with Lindsay. Which of the following would decrease heart rate? Increased, the increased parasympathetic stimulation? Yeah, increased no parasympathetic is correct. Yeah, that is going to uh, decrease the heart rate, right? If you remember. Um, it's part of the uh, sludgem, but you know, it's uh, sludgem, but the sludgem doesn't have, right, the decreased heart rate. So what can we do? Right? So you could also have dumbbell, uh, as sometimes they call the dumbbells, right? So it's the B here would be for the bradycardia. Right, remember, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI distress, emesis, meiosis, right? Um, so the same thing here, right? Uh, defecation, urination, meiosis, uh, B for bradycardia. Emesis, lacrimation, salivation. They're just different order. But uh, dumbbells, right, bradycardia. I, I think they, there's a double B. There's also bronchospasm. What about the Gs? Um, gastrointestinal distress. So that, that, that doesn't have it. So you see how some of them are missing? stuff so, but if you have yeah. both sludge and dumbbells probably uh should be in a correct ballpark right uh, i think the reason the reason uh why uh dumbbells in some books are preferred they call them the killer bees right the killer bees being this and this but um but both of them should be uh good mnemonics for you guys uh, by the way, what, what these are, this, these are the effects of the parasympathetic stimulation or organophosphate poisoning, which will be heightened parasympathetic response. Okay. Uh, number 111. Uh, um, Lindsay was the last right to go? Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, we're going to go with James for 111. Drugs that block the beta-1 um, adrenergic receptors will decrease your heart rate yeah B. that is decrease the heart rate anyone tell me a uh, beta beta uh one adrenergic receptor that that is a blocker so what's a beta blocker any medication that's a beta blocker metoprolol yeah so anything that ends in lol right metoprolol atenolol uh propranolol any lol ending of the medication Asmolol, right, will be your uh, beta blocker. The only distinctions there being which is, um, I should say, which blocks both, right? So it's non-selective. You can have non-selective beta blocker blocks both uh, beta receptors, beta 1 and beta 2. You have a selective uh, receptor blocker, like let's say beta 1. Can anyone tell me, I'll, this is just like, I, I want to see your thought process, right? Is there any condition states where I may not want to give a non-selective beta blocker in the sense that there's a medication, let's say, blocks both beta 1, so blocks both beta 1 and blocks both beta 2. Is there any condition states that a patient may have where I may not want to give this medication to? Like COPD or asthma? Yeah, uh, yeah, correct. And why do... And why I do not want to give them such medicine. You wouldn't want to risk bronchoconstrict anymore? 
uh, correct. So if I give a non-selective, right, then their inhalers, right, their albuterol rescue inhalers may not function. So for those patients, we, we want to avoid giving them such a medication. There's another subset of patients where you want to be cautious with prescription of uh, beta-1 um, blockers for hypertensive control. And any of you can tell me that I'll be highly impressed. Say that again. Is there, there's another subset of populations where let's say if they have high blood pressure, right? Uh, and usually these medications are prescribed for them. You want to be very careful prescribing them beta blockers. Would it be pregnant women? Uh, not necessarily. Actually, uh, they give beta blockers to pregnant women because beta receptor blockers are one of the oldest drugs. And usually uh, the reason why they give a lot of uh, um, old drugs in the setting of pregnancies that they already know the side effects to expect. So actually beta blockers are do in fact given in, uh, you know, for pregnant in a pregnancy. So the reason the other subset is a, is a patient who is a diabetic, right? So if you have a, let's say a diabetic patient in the setting of hypoglycemia, right? Uh, you have essentially the counter regulatory hormones, one of them being epinephrine that's fired, right? So you see all those signs of, hypoglycemia has elevated heart rate, they may be sweating, right? Uh, you'll see that anxiety in them. And if you, if you give them a beta blocking medications for their hyper, hypertension control, right, you may not see their hypoglycemia side effects, you know, showing. It will be masked by these medications. So you want to be cautious prescribing beta blockers for your diabetic patients because in the setting of hypoglycemia, right, those, those things will be masked. So you'll, it'll be hard to see something to keep in mind, right? Uh, number um, 114, we're going to go with, I, I think Brian was next. Yeah. Um, activation of which kind of receptor causes heart rate to increase? Uh, beta 1 receptor. Beta 1 receptor, right? So uh, uh, medications, you're going to see in your protocols, right, that, that were added. Uh, we, we have epinephrine in the setting of bradydysrhythmia or bradycardia. And so they give you epi drip. And based on that, you know, right, epi has beta one properties, has beta two properties, has alpha one properties. But in this setting, we are focusing on right on the beta one properties. So yeah. what you're saying is that if we get a bradycardic patient, you're telling me that we're gonna be given epi drips now? Yeah, <laughs> you you guys are in for a treat because your new REMAC protocols have more drugs. A lot of them are weight-based drugs. So, so yeah, I heard it change. I heard, I heard everything is weight-based now. Yeah, it, that is true. And if um, I was a student in this class, I would make medication math your friend and do a lot of practice problems. I would say uh, every day do you know five to ten problems a day, uh, and uh, you know, drips, weight-based drugs, you know, your uh, bolus drugs. So yeah, calculate the medications, definitely know uh, your medication math. What about cardiac arrest? So are we still doing the one to uh, 10,000 epis every three to five minutes or they want that to be weight-based too? Uh, so no, the, you'll still have one milligram epi, right? That's based on AHA guidelines, right? But for pediatrics, those are gonna become weight-based. Well, they were yeah, weight-based. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that part, yeah. all right. But yeah, I would say I would say download the new protocols because that's what you're going to be tested on, and practice doing math problems off of those doses. Yeah. All right. So, uh, 114 uh, answer is B. We're going to go with 118. We have um, uh, Br uh, Brian just went, so we have Jackson. Number 118. Yes. The blank is the volume of blood in a ventricle at the beginning of systole. Um, e preload. Uh, so the in the beginning, so technically for this one, they want the specific name, right? So you, okay. you could, the, the preload would be like generally that comes in um, overall, right? So the preload overall that comes in, but what's the volume 
of blood right right at the beginning of systole. So preload is a general term. So here, uh, this, yeah. Um, so here, here the, so either A or B. B. So here the actual answer is C, right? So I'll tell I'll tell you why. So look, look, look let me just draw a ventricle. The here. end of diastolic B. So for so let me let me explain to you. So for here, right, the the question is asking essentially the blank the volume of blood in the ventricles at the beginning of systole. So it means uh, right before the systole starts, or so like the beginning of it, right? So here's your ventricles. Overall, the volume that comes in we call the preload, right? Preload is uh, coming in, filling the ventricles, right? But then uh, as the ventricles start to contract, right, uh, and the pressure, so let me say this is your right ventricle, this is your left ventricle, this is your right atria, this is your left atria, and these are the AV valves that separate these chambers, right? So this is this being the tricuspid valve, this being the mitral valve. Now, as your atria dumps the last amount with the atrial kick into the ventricles, as the the blood with the preload and now the atrial kick, the the blood here, right? let's say it's at this level as the ventricles fill up and they start to before they start to contract the moment the pressure here right the moment the pressure here exceeds the pressure in the atria these valves shut and the reason why they shut is that we don't want to backflow when the ventricles are actually contracting so when these valves shut and right before the contraction initiates right that that volume is called end diastolic volume Right, so, and it's basically the diastole has finished. We have the emptying of the right atria with the atrial kick that finally brought the last remaining volume into the ventricles. And the moment the pressure here, right, exceeds the pressure here, these valves shut. So now we have no communication uh, between the atria and the ventricles, and the volume that is now remaining here for which the contraction is going to cause it to be ejected from both ventricles is called end diastolic volume once they eject all this volume right the the next volume that's remained there is going to be end systolic volume the amount of that's remained there post ejection right after load being all the forces uh the ventricles have to work let's say this is your let's say this is your aorta and your blood pressure currently, let's say, is 160 over 90. So your afterload, this is your afterload, all the vascular resistance, systemic vascular resistance, that the left ventricles have to overcome in order to eject the blood out. So that's the afterload, right? And the stroke volume, right, is basically the amount of actually, the amount of blood that's actually ejected with each contraction, which is roughly about 70 ml, right? Uh, and if you want to calculate right your ejection fraction right it will be your shock volume over end diastolic volume right so your shock volume we said here an example was 70 ml and roughly speaking end diastolic volume would be roughly double that 140 ml so your ejection fraction if you remove this this will be one over two right seven over 14 so it will be 50 percent right so these are the terms for the heart uh any questions about this one okay no questions we're going to go back to uh ian for number 119. the volume of blood ejected from each ventricle during a contraction is called the stroke volume stroke volume is correct right stroke volume is the correct Roughly speaking, about 70 ml. All right, number 120, Irene. The blank is the amount of blood in a ventricle after it has contracted and what's the word after it? Uh, and before it begins to refill. And before it begins to refill, okay. Okay. 
before it begins to refill, huh? Okay. After it has contracted. Preload. Uh, so preload is the all the blood right that's coming in. So it's in the preload is passive filling, right? Okay, so it's so passive it's filling. After it has, so it will be the afterload. So afterload is all the, the afterload is actually that the is resistance. Good. This is the afterload. Is the resistance that the ventricles have to overcome in order to eject blood. So for yeah. we're here, the correct choice is actually B, right? So the and systolic volume. And Makes systolic sense. volume, right? So remember, yeah. end, diastol end diastolic volume is when the AV valves close right before the ventricles are about to contract. Once the mm -hmm. ventricles contract, right, that's what it says. The amount that is the amount of blood that's left, right, in the ventricle. After it has contracted. Yeah. Yeah. So that's end systolic okay. volume. So the contraction, right, we know contraction is systole and relaxation mm -hmm. is diastole. These mm -hmm. these two terms, preload, afterload, is basically preload is passive filling. Afterload is the systemic vascular resistance that the um, ventricles mm. have to overcome in order to pump the blood out. The, this is the, right, like let's say yeah. blood pressure 160 over 90, or could be 140 over 80, or whatever the blood pressure mm. is. Afterload is all that force that the ventricle has to overcome. And, okay. right, the other term, stroke volume, is basically the amount that's actually being ejected with each contraction, so we talked about that one. Okay, thank right. you. Uh, Milan, we 121. The amount of blood returning to the heart is the preload. The preload, uh, yeah. Uh, so it the amount of return to the heart is the preload. So, but in this in this uh, one, they actually call it the venous return. But I would accept either. Uh, I would accept preload. Right. I would accept the preload too. But this book keyed it for venous return, which is honestly, it's, it's this is not a great question. They all mean the same thing. For just. So we're clear. This book marked B as the correct answer. I would accept both answers. Um, okay, 120, 122 is uh, Lindsay. Stroke volume depends on all the following except the cardiac output because that's determined by the stroke volume. So the, the question here, right? Uh, Stroke volume depends on all of the following, except so let's let's let me ask you this, right? Let's see if you recall. What's the formula for for our uh, cardiac output? Uh, it's stroke volume times heart rate. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume, right? That's what you said. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So let's 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 think of it through, right? So this is the cardiac output, right? This is our stroke volume. Right? Right. Makes sense? So think yeah. about, so this question is asking, uh, out of all of, all, of, all of these, right? Uh, which is not, which is not accept, right? So let's, let's think about it. If my stroke volume changes, let's say, let's say now heart rate is 70 times stroke volume of 70 and my cardiac output is 4,900. Let's say my stroke volume uh, diminishes to 20. Does my cardiac output change? Yes. So then, uh, does it, so stroke volume is, does in fact depend on cardiac output. Okay. Yeah. I was, I was reading it real specifically like the other way around. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. You, um, so it does depend on the, and I, it does depend on the contract. It does, right? It does depend yeah. on contractility. If you want to remember a good mnemonic, so for your stroke volume, mm -hmm. a good mnemonic, it, it's PA, PAC dependent. So PAC dependent means it's preload, afterload, and contractility. Oh, no. Okay. So all these factors will determine the stroke volume. So... So then look, let's look at what's what what we got, right? So uh, A is end diastolic volume. It's very similar to the preload, but when the AVs are closed, so it's definitely going to play a role, right? Yep. Uh, contractility of the ventricles, was we, we just said, right? And then yep. 
the pressure required to pump blood of the aorta that's essentially you overcoming blood afterload. And the cardiac output formula is definitely dependent on stroke volume. So the it's only the interval BD and systolic because that's like that happens earlier than the stroke. It's not that related. I, I couldn't quite hear what you said. Can you repeat that again, Lindsay? Yeah. So uh, then the, would the correct answer be D because the end yeah. systolic is not. It's not so related. It happens earlier. That is correct. Volume. That is correct. So for one twenty two, the except one is the end systolic volume. The other ones are, are all all playing a role with the stroke volume, especially. Uh, the first three, sometimes they will, sometimes you will have terminology uh, that you may not, you know, used before, or it's similar, but it's not quite, you know, what you've been using. So you have to like reason your way through it sometimes, right? But uh, if I was going to remember a mnemonic for stroke volume, uh, PAC, right? Uh, think of it like your premature atrial contraction, right? So PAC, but in this case, it's going to stand for preload, afterload, and contractility. So all of these factors play a role in your stroke volume. All right. Any other questions about that, 122?